Good morning, good morning, Rabbi Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today, and the learning for this entire week is dedicated by the Daniel S. Loeb Torah Center. To sponsor a class, please reach out to us on info at egsny.org. Uh, either one, uh, one class a week's worth of classes a month, or even a year. Um, week of Breakfast in the Class today is that this week is dedicated in honor and in memory of Sinai Tour and Ibrahim Chosh Bach Alehem Hashalom, sponsored by the son Maurice Chosh. As well, uh, dedicated by and sponsored by Stephen Rappaport, the Breakfast King, in honor of and in recognition of Chacham Azriel Mansur for developing and maintaining his yeshiva, Shubi Nafshi, with top rabbis in Israel for his dedication to the community and for his tireless work for all Am Israel. I had the privilege of going to the yeshiva and to see, of seeing all the dayanim and the rabbis he's training. It's actually extraordinary. And then he surprised me and told me that I was speaking to them, which is wasn't, which was not daunting at all to speak to a bunch of dayanim and rabbis that are very, very, very uh, well learned. Hazaku Baruch Rabbi for scaring me uh, like that. We would also like to wish an incredible Mazal Tov and Mabruk to the entire Ibragimov and Esses family on the marriage of their children last night. What a beautiful wedding it was. We pray that they should be, merit to have many grandchildren, great-grandchildren, oskim batorah mitzvot, that will light up the world, that will bring them both tremendous nachat. We owe uh, Rabbi Ruvain and Nalini, Rabbi Tzin Nalini, such a debt of gratitude for everything that they do for our community and the young people in our community. So hazaku baruch, congratulations, mazal tov. Week of Kobe was sponsored by David E. Ash, who we'd like to welcome back as well is in honor of you and your unwavering commitment to doing everything you can for the state of Israel um, during these challenging times today and every day. Let's begin. My friends, our story of Shemot begins with the Jewish people's gradual descent into slavery. But by the end of the parasha, we already can hear murmurings of freedom. Now the parasha represents an inordinate amount of time. And it's one of the things that you could sometimes forget when you're reading the parasha. Right, you're going from line to line and you're like, okay, this is the story. And you don't realize that that story spans 20 years, 40 years, whatever. The biggest culprit of this has got to be Bereshit. From Bereshit until the end of Bereshit. Right? How much time are you talking? Ten generations from Adam until Noah, says the Mishnah and Avot. Ten generations from Noah to Abraham. Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, all the children of, of Yaakov. So you're talking about a span of roughly 24 generations in Sefer Bereshit. Okay? And then you have Shemot all the way through Devarim is 40 years. Yeah, 40 years is because is, is the beginning of the Makot, 41 years technically, because it's one year process in Egypt uh, from the beginning of, uh, uh, of when they get out. But from the descent into slavery, in other words, from when they get subjugated is 210 years. But then from when they get out, so from Parashat Vaira, or end of Shemot until the end of Devarim is 41 years. Sefer Devarim is? One day. 37 days. It's one long speech of Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah, Ve'ele Gematria. This, yeah, but it's a very, very, it's over many, many days, right? It's the last 36 days of his life. The way to remember that is Ele, Aleph, Lamed, Hey, is together 36, Ele, Adevarim. These are the words. How long do these words take Moshe to say? He speaks to them every day, and he gives them another piece of the puzzle of what he wants them to remember forever. And then the end is finally the last day of his life. It talks about the day after. Uh, which is very difficult to talk about. Just ask Netanyahu. But the point is, uh, there's 36 days plus the day after, and that is a 37-day, uh, what's it called? Uh, you are hearing the youngest member of Breakfast in the Class crying in the background, which is very, very warm and fills us with great feelings. Now, my friends, I just want to say, and I think this is really important, it, as we descend into this slavery, we start hearing the murmurings of freedom. And how do the murmurings of freedom begin? So I want to share uh, uh, how, how the story uh, takes place. Our rabbis tell us that Moshe is wandering in the desert outside of Yitro's uh, property, outside of Midian. And why is Moshe wandering in the desert with Yitro's sheep? Because Moshe is very strict 
with the laws of Geneva of stealing and to graze your animals in a land or in a place which belongs to somebody else is Geneva. Where do we find this machloket already? Machloket between the shepherds of Avraham and the shepherds of Lot. The shepherds of Avraham are taking their sheep way out to pasture because they want to make sure that it's for sure in no man's land. Shepherds of Lot are grazing in lands that are much closer, which may or may not belong to people. So Moshe is doing the same thing, way out in the middle of uh, nowhere. All of a sudden, one of the sheep bolts. Moshe is chasing the sheep far, 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 until finally the sheep, uh, uh, he, he, the sheep pauses to drink some water. Moshe Rabenu says, I didn't know that you were so thirsty. I'm sorry. Tell, he apologizes to the sheep carries the sheep back. And this, in this moment, that's when the story of the, uh, of the redemption begins. Suddenly, HaKadosh Baruch Hu appears to Moshe in a burning bush. This is where it takes place, in our parasha. Moshe Rabbeinu sees a bush that is a fire, but it is eneno ukal, but it is not becoming uh, consumed. So a fire is raging in this bush, in a thorn bush, and Moshe is staring at this, unable to understand, to comprehend why the, the, the bush is being consumed. Okay. Ha, sorry, it's not being consumed. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, 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 calls out to Moshe. Moshe says, Ineni, and then God tells Moshe, I've seen the suffering of the Jewish people and I want you to go be the one who's going to redeem them. Moshe spends the better part of, uh, of uh, days convincing God not to do this and they're going back and forth. Seven times back and forth. And back. Go, I, I, I can't go. I go, there's someone better than me for, instead of me. Go, I can't speak properly. On and on and on and on until finally God says to him, Mi sampela adam, I'm the one who decides if a person can speak or not. If I wanted to heal your speech impediment, I could. If I wanted to hire someone that was a great orator, I could. I'm choosing you. It has to be you. And finally, Moshe, with no choice, um, uh, acquiesces to God's command, and he goes to Egypt. My friends, I want to point out uh, a couple interesting things about this story. Number one. Why is it that in this moment, when we're discussing um, Moshe Rabbeinu running after the sheep, Hashem appears to Moshe? I kind of think that there's a couple better moments where this could have happened. Like, as an example, the moment when Moshe risks his life to save another Jew's life from being beaten by an Egyptian taskmaster. I can imagine Moshe kills the guy, saves the innocent person. Hashem is like, Right? Boom. Appears. I would imagine that would be a good spot. Also, you would have saved Moshe the long, arduous journey to Midian. The Midrash over there tells us wild things that happened uh, from the time that Moshe left Egypt until he gets to Midian. What goes on in Kush, etc., etc. Wild stuff. But, why does God not appear to him then? Or, as an example, why does God not appear to Moshe in jail? Many people do not know that Moshe spends time in jail. Did you know that? Where does he spend time in jail? Yitro locks him up in the basement. I don't know. Our uh, forefathers and uh, really, it's a difficult life, right? Locks him up. Tsipora is the one that brings him food. She sustains him while he's being locked up as this, uh, as this person, as in Yitro's, in Yitro's dungeons. But my friends, um, why does God put Moshe through this? And if he does, why, why here? Why now? And I think that there's something, a beautiful, a beautiful lesson. And our Chavim explained to us <coughs> that to lead the Jewish people requires many things. It requires wisdom. It requires more than anything else, patience. <laughs> right? It requires a lot, a great many character traits. But what God wanted to see was that Moshe Rabbeinu was capable of doing something which on the surface seems ludicrous. Why is Moshe running after this sheep? Because he cares even about one sheep. All the Chachamim and the Mepharshim ask a bomb question. You ran after this one sheep because you care even about one sheep. What did you leave when you ran after the one sheep? All the rest of the sheep. 
Moshe left all the rest of the sheep to chase after this one sheep to make sure it was okay to bring it back. Right? What is he doing? How could he? That doesn't seem like a very good shepherd. And the answer that they bring down is one which is so insightful. And yes, Adina, it is very symbolic. Let me explain the symbolism here. A leader is a person who understands that the community is made up of individuals. And if you're not taking care of one of them, then you were never taking care of all of them. Even if you were present. Let me explain. It was one of my favorite stories. I became uh, a posthumous student of Rav Shlomo Freifeld. 18 years after he died, uh, I made him my rabbi. Now you could have a rabbi in different things. You can't ask different questions to different rabbis in halakha. You know, you know this guy's leaning over here, that guy's leaning over there. You know, you, you have a laundry list. You're like, honey, who'd you call to answer? Oh, you called the wrong rabbi, right? No, you can't do that. Aselecha Rav, it says, doesn't say Aselecha Rabbanim. You're supposed to have a rabbi, that's the rabbi you follow, that's the rabbi you follow uh, through everything. However, um, a person is allowed to have many rabbis to learn many things from when they're not contradicting one another, okay? Or when they're not in different areas. A person could have a rabbi for Midot, a person could have a rabbi for Gemara, right? A person could have a rabbi for Halakha, etc., etc. However, I, I, uh, I took on this rabbi because if anyone wants to understand why, buy the book, you'll thank me later. It's called Reb Shlomo. A great rabbi bought it for me as a gift when he stayed by my house. And I asked him, why, thank, why of all books did you buy me this? He says, I want you to look, whenever you look at your bookshelf and you see a book that says Reb Shlomo, you'll remember that one day they're going to have to write a book about you. And maybe you'll act with great wisdom. Or maybe you'll do something better because you're thinking about the fact. Kol ma'asecha that all of your deeds are being written in a book. Okay, my friends, so I want to share with you one story in the book of Rav Shlomo. Rav Shlomo was a, Rav Shlomo Feifeld was a very big, uh, a very big, powerful person. He did tremendous things in his community. He ran a yeshiva, he built a camp, he built a community, he built a synagogue. Some of you may be familiar with his yeshiva, with the yeshiva in Farakah, we called Shar Yoshev, okay? That is his yeshiva. And he, he was a lover of all Jews, of all different kinds of Jews, of, of the Jews that nobody wanted he loved. He took in anybody and everybody, no matter what they knew, no matter what their background was. Very, very special person. Yeah, very similar. On every page of this book, in my, my community, in my, uh, sorry, in my bookshelf, you'll see, my library, when I'm reading a book, the book gets mangled because every page that I see a chidush, or something I want to remember, I'm folding down the corners of the pages. So all of my books, the pages are all folded down. I got the custom from my wife's grandfather. Um, and I not only fold the corner in a nice genteel way, I aggressively fold the corner to the point on the page that I want to remember. So it's like, literally, it's like sandwiches everywhere. It's just horrible. But it's helpful for finding it when you go back later on. In Rev Shlomo book, every, practically every page is folded. Some pages are folded numerous times. And I want to share with you just one story. There was a fellow who came to visit Rav Shlomo Freifeld in his summer camp where he had all of the boys. And the rabbi sitting in the heat of the day learning with two boys. Two boys that were, uh, you know, rambunctious. Didn't fit in anywhere else. Maybe they got thrown out of their yeshiva. They came to him, uh, last stop saloon, okay? Rabbi's learning with them in the afternoon in the, in the, uh, in the summer heat. All of a sudden, a big rabbi walks, is walking down towards them, big beard, looks very hashub. So the boys get up, they invite the rabbi to sit with the rabbi, and it and, uh, turns out that this rabbi had studied uh, back in the day with Rabbi Freifeld. And the rabbi says to him, he says, listen, rabbi, I don't understand. Rabbi to rabbi, mano e mano, tell me, how is it that I'm a, a guy, we learned in the same yeshiva, had the same rabbis, came from the same background. And what am I doing? I have a, maybe I'm a fifth grade rabbi, sixth grade, seventh grade rebbe. And you, you have a yeshiva, you have a community, you have a camp, you have this, you have that, you're world famous. How, how, how did it happen? You have to understand that how much is behind that question. How much pain is behind that question. You know? Anyway. 
Rav Shlomo says, yeah, look, I guess Hashem decides, you know, in his humility, he didn't want to say that he was better than him in any way. You know, he said, blamed it on Hashem. When the rabbi left, the rabbi is shaking his head back and forth like this. And the students say, Rabbi, is everything okay? And he says to the boys, he mutters, everybody wants a yeshiva, and everybody wants a shul, and everybody wants a community. But who wants to learn with two boys in the middle of summer's day, in the heat of the afternoon? What is a yeshiva if not for two boys, if not for one boy? What is a synagogue if not for one couple or one family or one man or one woman? It's difficult to make time for the individual when you're trying to lead the many. But the many is just many individuals. And if you're not taking care of the individual, if you're not trying, sometimes it's a Herculean task, sometimes it's an impossible task. I don't know that God was rewarding Moshe for catching the last sheep. I think God was choosing Moshe because he ran after the sheep. He didn't get angry at the sheep for running away. He says to the sheep, you were hungry, if only I would have known, you were thirsty, if only I would have known, I would have made sure to give you water back there. You have rabbis sometimes, or leaders, you have parents, you have role models, who look at their mentor, at their mentees, they look at their students, they look at their congregants, and they yell about this, and they yell about that, and they scream about this, and they scream about that. But what they don't realize is, there's a reason the sheep ran away. And look at what Moshe does. He doesn't hit the sheep, teach it, educate it for next time, beat it up, make sure he never runs away again, put a ball and chain on his leg. He seeks to understand before he's understood. You must have been thirsty. Let me carry you back. A rabbi's job is to carry the sheep that ran away back to the fold. A rabbi's job is to ask and wonder, what did the sheep run away from in the first place? You know, many times when we're diagnosing someone that left religion, and leaving religion is not as dramatic as the song would have you believe. Losing man, it's not, it's not as dramatic as that. You don't need to be standing in the corner losing your religion. It's not a zero-sum game where you have nothing or everything. A guy who used to go to shul during the week and now only comes on Shabbat is losing his religion. A guy who used to come on Shabbat and now comes on the holidays is losing his religion. A guy used to eat fully kosher and now is eh. I don't know what the exact definition of that half-hearted eh is, but I kind of feel like you get it. It's losing his religion. That's how you lose things, in, in pieces. I used to study every day. Now, if I can be bothered, I put on a podcast. Someone, I love when people come to me and very confidently tell me, Rabbi, I never miss a podcast. I listen to you every week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know it's daily, right? <laughs> there, is, there are so many that you're missing. I'm glad that you listen once a week. But my friends, there's two ways to diagnose that guy. One way is, what's wrong with him? Why is he only learning once a week? But maybe the more correct way is, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Why is he only listening once a week? Maybe my... Maybe my breakfast in the class is too long. Maybe it's too complicated or not complicated enough. Maybe I need to invite him to a more complex shiur because he wants to go to a learning inside Gemara type class. Or maybe he has zero background. So when I'm talking about somebody, you, you know, you, you will be astounded how little some Jews know about Judaism. I remember someone once coming to ask me a question. I said, uh, can I help you? She says, yeah. She says, is it true that Jews have to believe in the Messiah? I said, yes, it's true. She says, well, then Judaism makes no sense. I was like, 
Sorry, what? She goes, because Jesus has already come. I was like, I'm sorry. What are you saying to me? <laughs> she says, Judaism doesn't make sense. Because we have to believe in the Messiah. And Jesus, the Messiah, already came. And look, there's still wars. How do you live with yourself, Rabbi, believing that Judaism? I was like, Jesus is not a Jewish thing. I mean, he was Jewish, but it's, we don't believe that he's the Messiah. That's Christianity. She's like, oh, so that's not a Jew? This is a literal conversation. Where am I having this conversation? In the hallways of a Jewish high school. In England. JFS. A student, yeah, that would be really weird if she was not a student. And there, and then I also had the conversation. That would make so much more sense. A Jewish student in a Jewish high school could believe that Jews believe that Yeshu is the, is the Mashiach. And therefore, she doesn't know how we believe in Judaism, because obviously Judaism makes no sense. Now, it's my fault for being surprised. Just like a rabbi needs to study Torah, a rabbi needs to study his students. Just like a father or a mother needs to teach their children, they need to learn their children. And then to understand, if I talk to my child this way, it makes me feel better. Because I yelled at them for doing this thing which is so terrible. It makes me feel better, like I'm a disciplinarian. But actually, it did nothing for the child. There was zero net positive and, and probably a lot of net negative. So what does Hashem do? He sees Moshe running after the sheep. And after he sees that Moshe could run after one, after he sees that Moshe understands that if you're not running after one, you're not taking care of any. After he sees that Moshe understands that it's not a numbers game. That's what most people would say. Okay, what am I going to do? I lost one. I run after one. I lose more. Numbers game. The very, the very conditioning of your mind to feel that way is already, it tells you that you're not fit to be a Moshe Rabbeinu. So when God sees that, what does he say? Moshe, Moshe. He appears to Moshe in the burning bush. And interestingly, what does Moshe notice before he gets called? He sees a bush that's burning. Why does God, I mean, I kind of imagine, I don't know. I kind of imagine, I, I'm a very weird person. I, I've fully embraced my weirdness. I imagine these things because I have a very active imagination. So I like to imagine these. I just like to imagine I was hanging out in Shamaim, little metaphysical fly on a metaphysical wall in God's metaphysical living room. Just imagine Hashem having like tea with the Malachim. And he's like, so uh, I think today I'm going to redeem the Jews from Egypt. And the, the angels are like, oh, that, that's not scheduled for another 190 years. They whip out the metaphysical calendar. And Hashem's like, yeah, but I think it needs to be now. And he says, I have this guy in mind. They're like, oh, really? Ooh, he's like, oh, Moshe, you don't know him. He's a shepherd, whatever. Really nice guy. This is how I'm imagining this is going. And then the angel's are like, oh, brilliant. Have you told him yet? No, I'm going to go tell him now. Um, and they're like, oh, fantastic. So you probably need the blowhorn, the one that you used when you said Avram, Avram, the microphone. We want, should we get that for you? Do you want the reverb, right? Etc. <laughs> Avraham. I, I don't know. Do you, do you ever imagine what God's voice sounds like? Or is that just... Yeah, you imagine James Earl Jones, right? You imagine. How weird would it be? I would be very, if I was a Navi and God called me and his voice was like, Shlomo, I would be like, no. No, no. <laughs> we, we need to work on that. Morgan Freeman, are you available Thursdays? <laughs> we need lessons, right? I don't know. I imagine, right? So, what, you need, what do you need? You need the microphone. Moshe, Moshe. What's this game with the bush? Does anyone else wonder these things? He tells the angels, guys, I need a bush. And they're like, Anheuser bush? No, they're like, what kind? <laughs> sure, I said, on the double. What kind of bush? Uh, uh, we'll probably make a beautiful, like maybe something nice. With, no, no, it's got to be thorns. <laughs> okay, thorns coming right up. And then Hashem's like, I need a match. Right, right? And he lights it on fire. 
And why? Why is the charade necessary? Why is the charade necessary? So Adina wants to say that it requires Moshe noticing it. I kind of feel, I always kind of thought that maybe that was the reason that Moshe would see a bush on fire and he would, you know, Hashem would see if Moshe noticed it. I kind of feel like if you're going to choose the one guy to receive Torah for all of humanity, you might want to go a little more subtle. Like, let's see if he notices that, I don't know, the leaves are growing upside down on the same bush. That would be like, wow, powers of observation, A+. Plus. If you see a bush on fire, I kind of feel like most people would look. And yes, it's true, and then Ukal, what was God showing Moshe Rabbeinu? And there's many, many levels and many lessons to this bush. Our rabbis tell us, number one, that God was symbolizing to the Jewish people, Imo Anochi B'Tzara. Look, I'm not appearing in something beautiful and something magnificent. I'm appearing in a thorn bush where people get scratched, they get hurt. Because if the Jewish people are hurting, I'm hurting. I kind of feel you don't need the fire for that message. Right? You don't need the fire for that message. So what is Hashem saying? It's not, it can't be the, the entirety of the message. So I think that there's something here which is, uh, which is very beautiful and with that we'll end. If the reason why Moshe is chosen is because along with all the other character traits, he also has this beautiful characteristic of seeing every single individual, of caring for a sheep, of not being upset, of having the patience to go get it, of asking himself, what, what did I do wrong that made the sheep run away? If Moshe has all of that, it stands to reason that if that's the reason he was chosen, then that should also be part of the message that God is giving to him in the moment when he's calling out to Moshe Rabbeinu. And I think that that's perhaps where the line of reasoning has to lie. Our Chachamim tell us that what Hashem was showing him was that this great vision of something that is consumed, something that is burning, but does not get consumed. Now I need to share with you something. One of the rules of thermodynamics, which is very upsetting to me, that there are four rules, right? Is that right, four rules? Sorry? Um, you, you might want to check on Wikipedia. Anyone have a Google, can someone Google that? Turns out that there's rules of thermodynamics, and then, randomly, they just decide that there's another rule. Anyone? You got it? Who's got it? All you have to type in is thermodynamics. Have we found it yet? Four rules of thermodynamics. Okay? Four rules of thermodynamics. And one of the rules is the constancy of mass and energy. Is that right? I mean, you, want to, you might want to check that as well. So in other words, the transference of mass and energy. So when you take the mass and you convert the mass into energy, so then that mass becomes energy. But the mass itself, there is always the same amount. There's a consistency across those things. So there's either the mass or the energy. The thing that produces the fuel for the fire or <coughs> the energy released by the consumption of that mass, of that fuel, okay? That idea, this concept, is what God was breaking with the bush. Hashem says, if the thorn bush represents pain, understand this, that pain is fuel. It produces something. But understand that it's not just that the pain is the price of growth. The person is not diminished in that process for that growth. Did you hear what I just said? The mass will produce the energy. But the mass will not be in the process of transference to energy, to fire. It will not be consumed. You're looking at Egypt and you're looking at the suffering of the Jewish people. There are two people that could go into a moment like that, suffering like that, and save the people like that. They could see the people as victims, as people that are broken. And maybe there's justifying that pain with purpose. Maybe you could say that there's a reason why they had to suffer. 
But God said, if that's what you think, then you are not fit to be the leader. Because what you've done is you wrote off 210 years. You wrote off sickness. You wrote off death. You wrote off worry, anxiety. Tell somebody who suffered in their life, you know what? In the end, it's going to be okay. Thank you very much. You know what? It's un just inconvenient for me. I don't live in the end. What about the now? What about the here? What about the pain? I'll give you an example to this, and then with that we'll, fit, we'll conclude. I like saying at weddings that everybody gives you bad advice before you get married. And they tell you that marriage is about compromise. And I think that that's terrible advice. Let me explain why. If you could get away with it, never, no. The reason, I say it's terrible advice. Why? Because if a person is compromising in marriage, they're giving up 50% so that they get 50%. That means that from the beginning of their marriage, they are dooming themselves to be unhappy 50% of the time. That is a terrible idea. What you should do in marriage, in love, is find someone that you're happy to give you're happy to give that 50% to them, not because of compromise. It winds up that sometimes you got what you want because you got what you wanted. And sometimes you got what you want. You know why? Because the person you love was made happy by you giving them what you want. And you are happy to give for love. Then you never compromised. Then you're always happy. Is that clear? Find that person that you were willing to give in that way, and then the sacrifice doesn't feel like a sacrifice. God says to Moshe, there's a heck of a lot of thorns in the Jewish people's future, in our history. A true leader is not a person who says, Od yavo shalom aleinu. Hu yase shalom aleinu. That peace is over there, that good days are coming around the corner. You know, if you're that person, then you, don't, you can't lead the Jews. You know why? Because there's so much of our life that is difficult. And then you live all this in between time in pain. He says, Moshe, you know how I know you're my guy? You're my guy if you could understand that there's fire and energy and power and passion and warmth in pain. And eneno ukal, that the mass can provide energy without actually giving up anything. How do you do that? If you figure out that, that's when you live an energized life. You have no good days. You don't have bad days. You just have days. And every day that you have is a good day. And what are you going to make out of it? And if you're starting in a negative, what do you do for that? You lost some money yesterday. So today, aren't you going to go make a profit? You lost money three minutes ago. What do you do? What's the response to that in business? Go out and try to sell the next thing. My friends, if that's how we live, that's how we, uh, that's how we thrive. God wanted to see Moshe, I see that you care so much for everyone. But there are two types of people who care. One person cares and comes to you and says, Oh, your life is so hard. I don't know how you do it. You're amazing. Your life is so difficult. And they reinforce the person's version of their life, which is that my life is painful. And then there's another person who says, there's a fire here. But you know what? Eneno ukal. There's no less of you because of that fire, because of those thorns. That's the Moshe. That's the leader that the Jewish people need. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.